So、uh, the year after I started my graduate studies at the Fletcher School,、uh, a film came out called *The Lord of the Rings*, based on, on the book by Tolkien. And I went to see this film with a close friend of mine, and it started a bit of a running silly joke.、Uh, after that, every time I would try to say anything with、uh, any amount of gravitas or intelligence, my friend would call me Gandalf, the wise old wizard, minus the beard, of course, and I would call her Frodo, the child hero and the explorer. And I got to thinking about the role that Gandalf the Wizard plays as an archetype that sort of guides and governs the kind of perception that people have of the development sector.、Um, Gandalf and archetypes, I thought, would be a, a useful tool in that these are things that we essentially all understand intuitively from Carl Jung's collective unconscious. And I thought that this archetype actually fits in almost subliminally with the development world. The wise old man. Is mythic. He's all-knowing. He's a source of guidance. The sage, the Senex of ancient Rome. In some ways,、um, this archetype manifests in the form of well-branded institutions, banners that we all recognize,、uh, experts that are innovating and creating the best silver bullets, creating the solutions that will chart the course of human progress for the bottom billions at the base of the pyramid. And by the way, I think the、uh, the presence of a long silvery beard as well probably helps with you know the credibility at the project tables. I've often been told.、Um, the next archetype that I'll mention is the alpha male.、Um, the alpha male often manifests as sort of an investment banker, the wolf of Wall Street, a world leader in some cases. I might shift the image to something a little easier on the eyes.、Um, The, the alpha male is the fittest uh, survivor. Uh, the ultimate destination of the alpha male's behavior is power, and、uh, essentially, this archetype is one that has traits that we all also recognize. There's a certain amount of arrogance, domination, aggressiveness. It's all about classic zero sum for the alpha male, and in some sense,、um, this manifests in nature. In fact, I heard a story recently about a, a troop of chimpanzees that. Brutally deposed a former alpha leader that had dominated them in years past, and when the alpha tried to re-enter their community, the younger male monkeys not only remembered him, but they tortured him before they killed him, and they had to put a viewer discretion on the video. So,、um, I mean, before I continue down the very slippery slope of、uh, being a woman talking about alpha males, I should probably make an admission. I am a graduate of a, of a women's college called Wellesley, which is.、Um, Uh, sort of a, a bastion of American feminism, but I'm not here to male bash.、Uh, in fact, some of the most interesting examples of cooperation have emerged from patriarchal communities. And with a, with a colleague of mine, we were actually trying to、um, implement an impact investing network in the context of Atlantic Canada. And I picked up a book that was written by Daniel Paul called "We Were Not the Savages," explaining the experience of the Aboriginal and Indigenous communities of the Mi'kmaq Nation. In Atlanta, Canada, and what was so interesting was that this community achieved and lived with a value system that was fundamentally sustainable, collaborative, and harmonious. They were able to harness the better sides of the competitive sides of human nature while still retaining a deep spirituality and a deep respect for other living things. In fact, their civility far outshadowed that of those who tried to strip them of their lands and destroy their culture. There's basically in nature,、um, I think. A natural response to being subjugated by a dominant, as we saw in the case of the monkeys.、Um, there is no magical vacuum into which repression and injustice just magically disappear. And similarly, social justice sensibilities don't emerge from a vacuum either. We're all part of a functioning system, and in some sense. I think this is why a capitalist system that functions on the basis of alpha male survival of the fittest behavior is inevitably going to result in some sort of violence or inequality, unless we find ways to better harness the better sides of this archetype. Now,、um, unsurprisingly, the next archetype I'll refer to is the divine feminine. And again, I'm not talking here about men or women. I'm talking about what we typically understand to be the role, the female gender role, and its、uh, ability to establish sort of、um, a dynamic of collaboration, the likelihood of empowering marginalized voices, achieving win-win outcomes, and better managing risk in investment portfolios is one that's well proven、um, by、uh, those who are int intentionally more collaborative.、Um, and I think. That if we shift for a moment to 
sort of the, the, the collaboration models, we'll find that um, uh, the behavior of this, this archetype is something that uh, will govern what we see ahead. I think that there's a fundamental shift, and I saw this delightful image in the news a couple of weeks ago, some of you may have seen it, set up on International Women's Day um, by a hedge fund manager that I thought captured sort of the clash of the archetypes brilliantly. This little girl, defiant, standing in the face of the representation of the capitalist system. So, um, there's a purple elephant in the room, and it took a lot of self-restraint not to put an image of a purple elephant behind me. Um, the purple elephant in the room is that the wise old wizard of development is challenged, not because his knowledge is not brilliant, but perhaps because of how it's imparted, and maybe a little bit because of how it's funded. Now, it's not news that the development arena and international institutions are not known to be the most agile and transparent. We know that there's a certain level of bureaucratic heaviness that comes with a lot of these institutions. And in fact, there's a body of literature. One of the first books I read was The Lords of Poverty, given to me by my office mate when I was at the ITU at the United Nations, um, describing some of the miscalculations and the problems sort of inherent to how the, the arena works. And so examples like UN um, AIDS, administer, AIDS programs administered with you know, condoms stapled to information brochures or energy solutions in a box uh, deployed to villages or, or play pumps to draw water from the ground without thinking about how things need to be transferred for local ownership, without thinking about maintenance. And certainly the issue of fiefdoms, um, parallel events that take place within the umbrella of a single organization, or even parallel platforms within a single organization, all trying to solve the same problem uh, and sort of leveraging the intelligence of different teams that don't actually talk to each other. So in some sense, um, this is kind of a well-known narrative covered in lots and lots of books. Of course, there are, um, uh, I guess, moment, sort, sort of examples of light in Gandalf's den as well. Uh, we have the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. Now, with some of the governance issues that they've had that have been worked out over time, this has been an incredible, large success in the sense that they've been able to gather over 1,600 signatories, the world's largest institutional investors, signing on to an agreement about certain principles. And really, who else could have pulled that off? That was set off by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. Um, we also have sort of examples of organizations like the World Bank. And going back to the aid organizations and just global aid for a moment, um, apparently about $2.3 trillion has moved from the global north to the global south. And it's important to note that you know, this, this money runs through institutions and organizations and departments and divisions, and it also fundamentally runs through you and through me, all of us who are personally complicit in the development arena. Now, apparently, to, in order to reach the Sustainable Development Goals in 2030, another $2.5 trillion needs to be spent. That's an estimate that I read. So if we think for a moment, not just about the cost of capital, but about the transaction costs of getting that to where it should be. I think it's interesting. Um, I, I mentioned for a moment, because we're here in Armenia, I, I had a chance to do my PhD research here in Armenia in 2004, and I was researching the role of information and communication technologies in political development. And it was an amazing place to do research in some ways because it's, a, it's an excellent development laboratory, it's a small country, it's homogeneous, and everybody, everybody's about one degree of separation away. Um, Armenia received about $3 billion in overseas development assistance. Uh, and I did a bit of uh, back-of-the-envelope analysis, analysis, and I was figuring out that, so for every one dollar of ODA that comes into the country, about three dollars comes into this country in the form of remittances, as compared to just under two dollars in the case of other low- or middle-income countries. For every one dollar of ODA, we see about one dollar of FDI, foreign direct investment, coming into this country, which, uh, as compared to a little over three dollars for other low- or middle-income countries, and there are stories in every one of these comparisons. For every $1 of ODA, and this is a major lowball figure, just because um, I tried to calculate it on the back of the philanthropists that I know of, but at least 25 to 50 cents on the dollar comes in in the form of philanthropy from the diaspora. So for every $1 of ODA coming into Armenia, at least four more dollars is coming into this country in the form of external capital. In real terms, that amounts to about $36 billion since independence. That's not even counting state budgets. So, um, and that's also in light of a population that has decreased a little bit over the years as people have sought economic opportunities abroad and it's stabilized, stabilized now around, I think, about three million people. So, 
the net result is that one in three Armenians today apparently live under the poverty line, with all of that money coming in. So either what's happening is that the capital flowing in is slipping through the margins, slipping through the cracks, and not reaching its intended purposes, and or there is a massive, what I'll call a collaboration margin. For every one dollar of ODA that's coming into this country, that's remaining underutilized or underleveraged in some way, I think that's the opportunity that we address today.、Um, when I was doing my research, I found evidence of what one of my favorite authors, called William Easterly,、uh, talks about as the technocratic approach to development, the conventional、uh, development paradigm, the idea that poverty is essentially a technical problem for which we require technical solutions, antibiotics. Pumps, or in my case, when I was researching them, websites and fiber optic cables.、Um, Easterly also talks about、um, in his book *The Tyranny of Experts* the idea that the real cause of poverty is actually the unchecked power of the state against its people, who have no voice, no rights, and no feedback loop. And I'll come back to that feedback loop in a moment.、Um, essentially. When I was looking at、uh, some of the ministries and agencies that were, that were administering and using technology to deliver service to citizens, I discovered that there was not a lot of coordination amongst donors who were trying to address these projects. In fact, with the help of those that you know I interviewed, we discovered that there were at that time, and I'm sure this is a much improved margin now, but there were 106 projects in parallel, all utilizing ICTs for public sector reform at that time, and. A lot of these projects were basically ending as soon as the money ran out. In the case of most of these donors, basically they come in again in Easterly's terminology as planners. They have top-down sort of perspectives. They have tick boxes and jargon they already have in mind. And、um, the searchers are essentially those who would come in, co-create, sort of listen to the market, and come in with no plan. So there are sort of two or di- two different perspectives. To、um, to the development sort of task, searchers, if they are good at what they do, will also leverage the passions of a diaspora. And I'll take a liberty to talk about a diaspora because I consider myself as part of one、uh, here in Armenia. And、um, uh, most of the diaspora to date,、uh, I mean historically, have not been the best searchers. Now this has changed in the last maybe ten years. And actually, where we're standing today is a perfect example of the new, innovative approaches that are being taken,、uh, that are much more sort of search-oriented.、Um, most、uh, planner-type、uh, approaches taken by diasporas have often treated symptoms, as opposed to thinking about sort of addressing underlying political or economic illnesses. Now, what does an investment approach to development mean?、Um, there's no debate that competition and business acumen and、um, Uh, sort of uh, uh, the rigor、uh, of a business lens are a good thing. Of course they are.、Um, the thing is, my ten million dollars、uh, in, in the form of a silver bullet, or another person's fifty million dollars in the form of a silver bullet, are not going to achieve their goals if they're not actually coordinated. Especially if we're out to try to,、uh, you know, solve a major development problem. In terms of the debate、um, around the approach of investors, I think there are certain characteristics to sort of the the business lens. There's a sort of、um, an ar- it, it comes back to the archetype of the Wolf of Wall Street:、uh, flag waving, territoriality,、uh, brandishing tools and weapons. The sort of traditional alpha investor will basically shrug his shoulders and sort of. Talk, to, you know, talk to an impact investor and say, you know, in the traditional financial markets, in the real world, in terms of how things work, we don't share diligence, we don't share information about pipelines, we don't share information about our portfolios, because that's just not how it's done. And、uh, I would argue, and I, and I don't suggest for a moment that we should be sharing information indiscriminately, holding hands around a campfire, singing songs.、Um, I actually think that. We have to bear in mind that the ability of our solutions that we're investing in to scale are a function of our network. The ability of our solutions to benefit from liquidity are a function of our network. And to that extent, I think that type of collaborative approach is useful. In capitalism 2.0, or in what we're talking about as post-capitalism,、um, what's interesting, I think, there's this big debate about the trade-offs of impact investment. And I think what spurs that is that there's kind of a clashing of the archetypes. And certainly, the impact investors are using sort of the tools from the traditional financial arena and the tools and the tools of the development arena.、Um, but the thing is, what's the net result if the venture capitalists beat the development wizards at their own game?、Uh, 
Um, the evidence base for impact investing has grown. There's uh, not a lot of questions. There's a lot of different sort of foundations, clubs, uh, and traditional consulting organizations that are providing ample evidence of the performance of impact portfolios when companies are able to embed impact into the DNA of companies. They outperform market benchmarks. So that's not new. Um, old, Olson um, is a social, Mansur Olson was a social scientist and an economist who basically talked about the logic that drives this. He talked about enlightened self-interest and the logic of collective action. And it turns out that this logic holds, and there's been recent experiments to prove this, when there are cases of social transparency on the contributions of people to those public goods. So um, what that means to me is that today, in a Twitter meets blockchain world, where everything that we do can be tracked, where our respective contributions are visible, we can actually establish the fabric of cooperation for better outcomes. Technology um, is a key driver for some of the best non-zero-sum interactions out there. And that includes things like surfing the World Wide Web, flying in airplanes, um, you know, raising crowd campaigns, um, and that kind of thing. I would uh, argue that um, this technology is actually a key to in, in sort of reinventing the fabric of human trust. We set up the Artha platform. The Artha platform uh, is actually a tool that we set up to enable sharing of uh, deal flow on a systematic basis and also to enable the ability for people to conduct due diligence with uh, access to people on the ground. So we don't actually have to fly a gringa in from Geneva to go and do a due diligence. If we're actually able to leverage the user-generated feedback loop on people's profiles, if we know that people trust the service provider, they can actually be brought in to respond on um, on a basis that makes sense. This enhances the efficiency of the impact investor in a given region. In this case, uh, the Arthur platform functions in India. And we've actually had a great example of the Inter-American Development Bank as a pioneering development institution uh, that has decided to adopt and adapt this type of architecture to be able to allow for the smaller tickets beyond, sort of far, far sort of um, to the left of on, on their curve of uh, ticket sizes, so that everything below two or three million dollars could be addressed by those more agile funders who can actually uh, leverage this type of a tool to, uh, to manage efficiencies. What we've discovered over the years after having built this platform is that actually there are a number of other platforms. Um, there are a number of other users um, and founders and innovators that have had the same thought. Um, Approximately, if, if this is just off the top of my head in terms of the peer networks and information infrastructure that's been set up, probably 60 to 70 million dollars at a minimum has been spent on building the kind of information architecture that we're talking about here. All of these are essentially aggregating information and trying to adopt and adapt sort of an open architecture approach to creating a, a coherent social capital market. We have a long way to go. And a lot of the discussion, the connective tissue that needs to be built, I believe, actually will reside and come back to the leadership of development organizations. Um, I would argue that, uh, essentially, we have to adopt sort of uh, the opposite of an alpha approach to be able to achieve these types of collaborations. We need to be radically collaborative with one another to be able to minimize and manage the costs of getting some of this capital to where it needs to get. Um, there's no point in having different organizations building solutions over and over, and yet we see this every single day. We have the technology to do better, to enable the types of interactions that will support outcomes-based models. Um, and essentially, trust is not only possible, it is the preferable uh, approach to um, achieving the kind of SDG outcomes we're all aiming for. Um, so what will be the sum behavior um, of our work here today? What, what will define uh, the essence of what you and me and what all of us are here to achieve? Uh, will it be the approach taken by the wolves of Wall Street? Will it be all about the council of elders? Or will we actually be open and resonant to the uh, quantum level evidence that the winners and losers in our system today are all one, we are all connected? In some ways, I think it's a perfect time to be rethinking uh, incentives. It's a perfect time to be rethinking sort of collaboration margins. Um, and it's time to sort of make it a taboo 
to make people, to see people and individual organizations working alone in solving problems that are not our own. So um, if we're going to actually sharpshoot those silver bullets that we've crafted and developed so carefully into the regions that we want to get them to, I think it's time that we start thinking about the slingshots we're using. And, uh, in, re and in reality, um, the, the wise wizards of development, the high priestesses of collective action, and the alpha males and the wolves uh, have never been better poised and positioned to collaborate for the greater good. Thank you.